Jennifer South is our presenter for today. She's um, going to talk about kind of the big picture overview of accessible technologies and formats. You'll remember that last time we had Deborah Fitzgibbons and um, Georgianne Hardy talking about what the, the law and the definitions and some of the technical stuff about AIM uh, was. But today we're going to see a lot of overviews and um, exciting um, uses of AIM for for our presentation today. I did want to mention to you that next time we're going to have um, Michelle Soriano and Kelly Suiting, who will, are from the National AIM Center, and they'll be talking about making effective AIM decisions and their four-step process that they use. But today we're going to have Jennifer, and I don't want to take any more of her time, so I'm going to stop sharing and invite you to share, Jennifer, and welcome everybody to Aim for Inclusion. Most helpful if I start by unmuting myself. So, okay, I'm hanging on here. Our practice session left me in a different spot. Let me get back to where I want to be. And Gail, thank you so much for the introduction. I um, I have a few of my beginning slides repeat some of that information so I can go faster over those ones. So <laughs> as, um, as Gail mentioned, I uh, work for Northwest Regional Education Service District. I've been there about 20 years now, which is always hard for me to believe when I state that number. Um, but I started there as an occupational therapist as my only role and then um, got lured into the world of assistive technology and all things kind of accessibility and have really uh, enjoyed that to the point where now that is uh, occupying my entire time at Northwest Regional. So um, I feel really fortunate to be uh, doing that. So I know that you're all, you know, it's the end of the day and you're all just kind of checking in here. But if you don't mind typing in the chat who all you are, who, who am I talking to in terms of your role? Are you um, teachers? Are you other assistive technology people, therapists? Who's, who's with us here today? That kind of helps me figure out... Um, what you already know. <laughs> cool. CODAs, PTs, SLP, awesome. All right. Yes. Okay. Well, that is helpful. You can keep them coming. But uh, so as I mentioned, I have some redundant information to what Gail just shared. Let's see. I kind of want to leave my chat showing, but um Ultimately, it's in the way. So Deb or Gail, if you see a question in there that I need to attend to, just feel free to unmute and call it out. So just really quickly, a review of that AIM cohort. So if you weren't able to join us for part one in the series, as Gail mentioned, that series is cataloged already. You can go back and watch it. Um, I know it's on the registration page. I'm not sure if it's made its way all the way into the OER Commons. But I provided a link down here in the bottom left corner straight to that OER Commons, and you can join that group and have access to uh, several resources that have already been entered and new resources that are getting created by the cohort. I came into this group uh, on the tail end of it, I feel like, and I'm kind of riding the coattails of all the great work that, that the team did. But they're actively working on a... Um, AIM guidance document and an AIM student advocacy guide, which we're all really excited about that. And then some educational opportunities, which this is part of. So with that being said, Gail already kind of covered that. So let's jump into my objectives is just to review some relevant definitions and um, okay, I'm not actually gonna review the laws. I'm gonna say they exist <laughs> because we wanna spend our time on more interesting things today. Um, then talk about what makes a format accessible or not accessible. And then just look at a few assistive technology tools or 
if you want to call them accessible technology tools to provide accessibility when it has not been built into the original format. And then maybe, I mean, I think by seeing who you all are on there, you probably know a lot about some accessibility tools already, but maybe you'll learn about a tool that you didn't know about already on your platform of choice. So uh, this material is really intended for everyone, but if you have experience with AT, I'm assuming most of this is going to be pretty familiar, but as this is getting posted on the Commons, we want to make sure that this is a complete course for people that may be coming in to this new, yeah, scale. Well, I just wanted to say one of the reasons we do this step-by-step -step basic series is, is for the participants who are on the webinar, but also because we hope that you will show this to your constituents as you are working with new teams and, and people new to the accessible educational materials idea. So um, you might Absolutely. think that way if you already feel like you know a lot about AIM. Yes, absolutely. So very quickly, overview of just the definitions that were covered in part one of the series. So accessible educational materials, right, are print and technology-based educational materials. So the old term was AIM, if you remember that, um, and that was a little more focused or made people think a little more just about that kind of standard print. But obviously, we don't only teach with print anymore, thankfully. So uh, we have all kinds of different curriculum to consider. Consider. So these um, are including printed and electronic textbooks and related core materials that are designed or converted in a way that makes them usable across the widest range of individual variability, regardless of format. And just a note, since you all have access to this presentation, all the links will take you back to the places where I got these definitions, resources, whatever. All of the resources are just embedded in here for you. So then the the technical definition of an accessible format is one I feel like you have to read a couple of times to say, what are they saying? But an alternative manner or form that gives an eligible person access to the work when the copy or phono record, that's a very old term, in the accessible format is used exclusively by the eligible person to permit them to have access as feasibly and comfortably as a person without such a disability. So basically, um, regular words, it gives permission to reproduce what would typically be under copyright into a different format for use by and only by the person who requires it. So it's not made to be reproduced and shared. It needs to be accessed by the person that requires the alternative format. So those are the technical definitions, but this is the heart of it, right? And this is where I borrowed my title from, was the definition of accessibility as found on the AIM Center website. So accessibility means that an individual with a disability can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services as an individual without a disability, and, you know, when you read that definition, if it stopped there, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But I really feel like the most important part comes after the comma in an equally integrated and equally effective manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. Right. It needs to be not creating an extra barrier for our students that need these different formats. So the heart of it is so we can acquire, engage and enjoy the same materials that everyone else is consuming. So that being said, what is not accessible? This is my slide to plug next session. <laughs> and also because I felt like it needed to be here. But so what is not accessible really depends, right? It depends on the learner's needs, the environment or conditions under which educational materials are presented and the task. And those of you familiar with AT and all of that, that sounds a lot like a familiar framework called the set, right? <laughs> um, looking at the student, uh, the environment, the task, and the tools. And really, you'll never go wrong if you keep that acronym in your head. <laughs> We're looking at, you know, student first, what they need to do. Tools and accessibility tools are always um, the place to come to, not the place to start with. You don't start with a tool and then work backwards. So in the next session, um, 
that will be with Michelle Soriano and Kelly Suiting from the National Center on AIM will go through um, basically how do you make good decisions about what a learner needs, which is honestly, you know, that's the beginning place. We need to know what a student needs before we can go about throwing a bunch of tools at them. But today I get to throw a bunch of tools at you. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't in my um, script when I rehearsed, that just came out. But anyways, so what are some types of formats with accessibility challenges? So they're gonna be different for everyone depending on needs as we've identified, but some common um, Common formats that may present barriers to access are just going to be text-based or what we used to call standard print text, which is basically static text and images. That could be digital as well, right? That doesn't necessarily just mean paper anymore. If we have text presented on a computer screen, but it's static and you can't interact with it, it's not really accessible. Um, vi videos without captions or narration, PDFs that are not accessible, images with embedded text, some learning management systems, which um, I listed these here not to call them out for anything negative. They're all great learning management systems. There's just some complications sometimes when you are trying to use accessibility tools over the top of those. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then I guess... This is from me, just from things I've seen out there in the real world, just other design flaws, I call them. <laughs> Not necessarily a format, but challenges just the same. Crowded spacing, visual clutter, confusing fonts, small fonts, no captioning, things like that. I There was a few years back in one of the districts I support, um, you know, as we go through tight budget times and the teachers were given basically a paper ration. <laughs> and so they were all trying to save paper. And their solution was to basically print everything for students on half sheets of paper. And it was horrendous <laughs> what I saw. I was like, no, what are we doing? We can't see these things. You know, there was complicated math worksheets with all these little formulas and symbols. And I mean, I'm getting out the magnifying glass with my reading glasses. So um, things, you know, it was a creative solution to double your amount of paper. However, we have to think about accessibility, which is just um, kind of a callback to, I think Deb talked about in part one of this series, the poor um, principles, right? So that stands for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. There's a link to information about poor if you want to learn more about that. And just remembering that digital doesn't always equal accessible, right? So we have to think about designing things with accessibility in mind, which is another session coming later. I'm having to refrain myself from giving too much information. Okay, so moving on. Some accessible formats that we talk about these days that we're trying to um, cover a wider range, right? We're not just talking about standard print and some of those um, basic things that we were talking about before, digital text. So I took Alice in Wonderland off of um, Project Gutenberg, which is a uh, repository for all the public domain titles, right? So, so I could use it without, although then I took movie covers, which are probably still copyrighted, but we, we, we're not making money off of this. So, <laughs> so up in the left hand corner, we have what is standard print text and in the middle center. So uh, from Project Gutenberg, I literally just click, clicked um, ebook and what you see in the middle of the screen popped open. I opened up Read and Write. This is the free version of it and clicked read and it just starts reading the book to you. So that is an example of digital text with the addition of a text reader tool over it, right? So technically the format is digital text and the tool would be a piece of assistive technology on top of that. Um, then there's large prints. Uh, going down to the lower left corner, audiobooks, and by definition, audio is only audio. There's no text paired with it. And I think probably in the December session, they'll cover why would someone want only audio without any text with it. There are some good reasons for that. Audio described a video. So I have a really quick um, video clip here. If you have a never experienced audio described video. It is basically a service for people who are blind or visually impaired that describes the 
the action that's taking place on screen because they can't see it. So now is when I get to hope that my technology all works and that you can see the screen it's switched to and that my <laughs> Wi-Fi is going to work. This turns to find the beast opening its jaws, revealing multiple layers of sharp teeth. She runs. As the creature gives chase, the twins leap into the bushes and hide. The others race down the narrow path, okay. but the bandersnatch okay. closes in. Of An here, army of red tights joins the creature in its pursuit. Each wears a red There we go. Okay. So I don't know if you've ever um experienced that before but it's an you know it's an interesting um thing to see that if you were blind or visually impaired you would have no idea what was going on in that screen it's just a bunch of loud noises and action-y sounds <laughs> so that describes the action and then of course movies with closed captioning braille and um tactile graphics so tactile graphics are images like maps, charts, and graphs that are designed to be interpreted by touch. So this example is not really a tactile graphic, but I was sticking with my Alice in Wonderland theme here, and I thought it could be a tactile graphic. It's laid out very nicely that it could be. Um, and then a person who cannot see the map could um, experience that uh, tactilely and get an idea of uh, that person's vision of what Wonderland looks like. So the next slide is just words explaining the exact same thing that I said on the last slide, just a lot less cluttered, which does help my brain. So this is also this digestive system slide is an example of an actual tactile graphic, right? So there's Braille that uh, gives the words for the components of the digestive system. And then you can see like the parts of the body are raised so that one could feel it. Okay, my obligatory it's the law slide. So here it is. I'm not even going to read it to you, but just know like we are doing this because we all believe in it, I think, but at the same time it's not just like, well, you know, let's do it if you think it's going to work out or if you can. Like it's the law. We are required school districts are required to provide accessible materials to those that need them. So Enough said. So if it's required by law, why do we need any tools at all, right? Well, I have a few reasons and you guys might have more. Feel free to chime in, but not everyone is there yet, right? I've been this year helping support um, a student that has some worksheets, you know, being given to them as a regular part of their education. And okay, how do we help the, you know, the adults around that student get this in an accessible format? So, um, when an educational material is given to a student that's not really in an in an hmm, I think that should say accessible. I'll fix that later. Um, and when it's not in an accessible format, we need a bridge to make it accessible. Some of these tools I'm going to show you might actually help create that bridge. It might help the teachers to create the bridge of some accessibility. And then, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you need a tool over the top of an accessible format. So a digital text reader with digital text is an example, a refreshable braille display with braille. Um, so there are lots of reasons why we still need some tools. And then because this um, AIM co cohort is really talking about learners across the lifespan, um, readers, people who need access to you know, printed text, they may not have the, um, it, you know, if they're not in school, they're not protected by the educational laws that require it and make it so. And so there's a lot of tools that can just really help um, people out there in the world that need it have access on the fly to some things. So finally to the part that maybe you came for. So enter. <laughs> the humble yet dreaded worksheet, right? I feel like it's in today's world, we're always like, ah, oh, not a worksheet, at least in my circle of, of colleagues, you know, it's like, why are we still using these worksheets? Well, there's lots of good reasons that we use worksheets. We just need to think about accessibility in them. So I thought we would take this one worksheet. I grabbed it from Teachers Pay Teachers, just like that. I, um, For the sake of this demonstration, I went and physically 
printed a copy so I could start with that and work backwards. But obviously I got it from Teachers Pay Teachers. It was already digital. <laughs> so if you have that, you know, by all means, you put the digital file in your Google Drive and you're halfway there. But um, so as I dive off here and start talking about a lot of different tools, I will just state for the record, I'm not endorsing any of these tools or you know, suggesting one's better than the other in any way, I have no financial incentive to do that. So, um, yes, I think my next slide I'm choosing to, <laughs> I'm not brave enough to do a live poll right now, I'm not going to lie. So, um, I was curious what types of devices your districts are using, or if you're here with one particular student in mind, kind of what devices are we primarily on? I think I know the answer to that, but I'm always very curious. Um, so if you all don't mind, if you're able to drop in the chat. Yeah, I'm thinking that it's mostly Chromebooks, but I am aware of some districts that are using iPads. Um, sometimes districts have iPads for younger students. Yeah, and then they jump to um, Chromebooks. Do we have any? What That's I'm curious it. about, and I, I think the answer is no. We're not really, we don't have PCs floating around anymore, right? Because Chromebooks are so much cheaper if that's <laughs> the idea you're going with, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to skip off of, off of that. So we're going to start with our little worksheet here. I am starting off with a product called Kami. It's an app on Chrome, which technically means um, you bring things into it because it's an application versus an extension that works over the top of wherever you're at on your Chromebook and basically kind of extends the function of that page. So Kami app, you have to bring things into. So this is going to show, and don't worry, there's no sound with <laughs> <laughs> I'm planning to narrate them in real time because the sound was just a little um, difficult to record the, the, when it is reading the digital text. And so you will be missing that feature of hearing the digital text voice, but trust me, it's reading. <laughs> so um, let's see here. Play. There we go. Okay, so the Kami app is just up there in the uh, toolbar when you're in Chrome. And I clicked on Google Drive and you could take it out of a folder if you knew, but for the sake of you not all seeing everything in my Google Drive, I just typed in the word Popsicle and open it up into Kami. And then, so I will say, while this is kind of doing its thing. This particular format, um, it didn't require, sometimes when you open a PDF in Kami, it, it says it needs to extract the text. It didn't do it with this one. It just started reading it straight away, but it wanted to read that name line. And if, I don't know if you can see, but it's the name line is a bunch of underlines. And so it literally said underscore, underscore, like 25 times. <laughs> <laughs> and was a little annoying. So you have to, you know, when you're using digital text tools, let me pause for a second. You have to, you know, kind of get used to little idiosyncrasies like that and find ways around it. So if you are a teacher creating the worksheet, maybe we don't need, you know, lines there, or maybe there's another way to do that. So the text reader is not going to read all of that. So what I was talking over was just showing that this tool has a built in dictionary that reads aloud. And then you can also just go down to the text uh, where they want the answer and insert a text box. And it has built in uh, voice typing up there, or you can type right into it. So this is one way to take what was a PDF worksheet and just be able to fully interact with it. There is a free version of Kami um, and a paid version. And you can kind of check, I put a link in the lower left corner where you can go and see a little bit more about that. So this next video I feel like is 
Um, well, I learned about it actually, Deb, from Robin Shobe when you had her on, I'm going to say six or seven years ago during a presentation. And my, my mind was blown. I'm like, what? This is just sitting here available to, <laughs> to everyone. It's built in optical character recognition in Google Docs. And I just, you know, I don't use it a lot. It's not a particularly flashy tool, but sometimes it does exactly what you need it to do and it's completely free. So when you go into your Google Drive, if you have a PDF worksheet, instead of right clicking, you left click and choose open with, and then choose Google Docs. And it performs optical character recognition and opens it in a Google Doc. So on the top, you're gonna to see an image of the PDF that it worked from. And below that, I'm trying to scroll my screen. It's a video, I'll do it in a minute. Um, <laughs> below that, it extracted the text. And in this particular case, so you can, like I just added a space there to format it a little bit more nicely. And then you can just listen to it and type your answers in. And this one translated perfectly. Sometimes if it's a, a worksheet that has a lot of boxes or pictures or extra decorative items, I'll just say, it's not gonna do as good of a job. But I just wanted to remind people that that's out there. It's free and it's a good tool. Um, this video, I am going to skip, but um, I always like giving you resources in case one particular thing is of interest, you can go back and learn about it a little bit more. This is just a explanation of select to speak in a Google Chromebook. We are about to talk about that. This video goes into more detail about how you can change uh, the settings, the speech settings, the voices, the speed and all of that, which um, you can watch the video for that. I didn't love the way she explained how you turn it on. So I have a super quick video that just shows how you enable it. And let's just walk through that. So down at where the time is, I call that kind of the systems tray. Go up and click on the cog wheel. And the accessibility setting has more reliably been showing up over there on the left, but sometimes it's been challenging to find. And if you just start typing accessibility, it pops up. You can toggle it on, close that window. And now when you go back to the system tray, you have an accessibility button that you can just click and turn on select to speak and dictation and it stays with the user. So if you have a student using a Chromebook and maybe they use uh, one Chromebook in English and then they go to social studies and they have a different Chromebook, they can log in and their settings will follow them. So that's pretty cool. I'm pretty sure, gosh, I feel like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that works. But anyways, um, as you can see, it's super easy to turn on. And so if that is something you didn't know about before and you took that away from today, then that's that's worth it right there. But now that we have those turned on, I just wanna show you how the select to speak tool works. So I, the only thing that I did ahead of time was just have this PDF in my Google Drive and have it open. I didn't do anything to prepare ahead of time. So basically, you just have your file open. If my video will play, you click the select to speak tool at the bottom, draw a box around the part you wanna to listen to. And it, um, in this case, it read the title, but then it went to what I wanted, which is, so it's got, as you can see, like the way that it's highlighting around that, it's not perfect. Uh, sometimes it does a better job than others. I I think if it was, you know, a Google Doc, I don't think it would have been doing that. I think that's partly because this was a PDF, but it's reading it accurately, which is really, um, you know, I guess it's both important to have. I mean, highlighting is an important feature. You can play with that in the settings, but truly for a, a um, free tool, it's just, you know, so valuable. You can pop that open on any screen that there's text on the Chromebook and it will uh, read it. 
So, oh, well, I just started it again. Sorry about that. Let's switch slides. Doing a quick time check on myself. Uh, okay, so I'm debating if we wanna show this. How many of you know <laughs> already how to turn on um, the speak selection on an iPhone or an iPad? Is that something that is commonly known or not very commonly known? If you can feel free to unmute and just holler or type in the group. I don't know how much people know about that or not. Not now. I'm, yes, I'm aware. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm seeing a little bit of each. Um, how about, can we have a short demonstration of it? That's, um, we'll see. The video, let's go ahead and start it. It's four minutes, which is maybe longer than we want to spend on it, but we'll see if we get some useful information and then we can With spoken content, your iPhone or iPad can read text out loud and you can customize settings like the speaking rate, pronunciations, and more. Here's how to set it up and use it. We'll walk you through how to use speak selection, how to use speak screen with the speech controller, and how to customize your spoken content settings. To turn on speak selection, in Settings, tap Accessibility, tap Spoken Content, and then tap to turn on Speak Selection. Here's how it works in action. Your device will read aloud text you select in compatible apps like Notes, Mail, Books, Safari, and more. Just select the text you want your device to read, and menu options will appear. Tap the arrow on the right until Speak appears. And then tap it to hear your selected text aloud. Ingredients. Two tablespoons sourdough starter. 600 grams flour divided. 10 grams salt. Water. Your iPhone or iPad can also speak the entire screen. And you can display the speech controller to quickly access controls like speech playback, the speaking rate, and more. To do this, tap to turn on Speak Screen in the Spoken Content settings. When it's on, you can swipe down from the top of your screen with two fingers to read, or you can ask Siri to read the screen. For quick access to the Speak Screen controls, tap Speech Controller, then turn on Show Controller. The first time the Speech Controller appears, it will be in the upper left corner. You can drag Okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop it there cuz I think that gives a pretty good overview of it. So that speech controller then puts a little uh, floating bar on top of the text and then you can, you know, as as it sounds, you can control the, the speech. You can stop, start, um, play. And that speak page is really handy if you have a whole page of text. You don't have to, you know, kind of do that where you hold on the text and try to drag it down to cover it all. If you have a whole page you want read, you just swipe down from the top and speak page and it'll just read the whole page to you. And now Jen, um, I keep calling it. Yes. I just, I just wanted to say Irene in the chat said, that she helps, I help my students with this on their phones often. And I I don't want to underestimate, uh, we've talked about Chromebooks and iPads, but I don't want to underestimate the power of phones in schools these days. So I just thought I'd bring that up. I agree with you. And I, I yes, definitely wanted to point out it works on a phone as well. It's interesting because that's a whole nother topic. Um, but a lot of our schools are really crunching down on phones uh, even more than they used to be. And we're finding that we have to advocate more to explain like this is their assistive technology tool. So, um, but I agree with you. It's hugely important that there's some tools right there on the phones that so, you know, most of our kids, if they're in middle or high school, have them at their fingertips and there's power out there, you know, and just being able to on the fly have something read to you, which 
is a great segue. The slide after this one is a phone slide, which I will get to in just a second. SnapType Pro. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar. I feel like I hear a lot of people talking about SnapType. So this is the two, SnapType Pro 2. And back when it was very first an app, which is a while back now, it was great because you could take a picture of that worksheet and you could enter text on top of the worksheet and then send it off to your teacher with the text still there. Really cool. It didn't read to you, which I always was like, well, it's halfway cool, right? <laughs> Just, I feel like if you need, you know, help um, writing, you might need that help reading as well. Well, guess what? Now it does that. And that's in part due to just advances in technology with the iPhone. So there's something now um, called live text. I think that's right. I'm not an iPhone user. So any if I'm saying it wrong, somebody please help me out. Live text is available if you take a picture with your iPhone and then of text and you it recognizes that there's text on the page and then there's a little button in the right hand corner that's kind of indicating text and it'll just start reading that. So basically OCR is built into all of our phones now. Um, and SnapType took advantage of that in their new app. Um, but then he kind of explains how they uh, fine-tuned it for working with SnapType. So I'm going to play this really quickly. This is Ben from SnapType, and I'm excited to give you a look at our latest app, SnapType Pro 2, which makes school worksheets easier than ever before. In this short demo, I'm going to show you how SnapType's new OCR, or text-to-speech capability, will help some of your students become more independent. First, we'll tap on the text finder icon at the bottom right of the screen. So that text finder icon this is the live text. all the text, text on our worksheet. That's what it this looks is possible like. thanks to Apple's Vision Kit. Although Vision Kit is great at recognizing text, it unfortunately does not have the logic to properly identify and group text into sentences, columns, and paragraphs. So we've had to build a lot of that recognition logic ourselves. Helping the app understand what text should and shouldn't be grouped together is actually a very challenging task since every worksheet is unique. Nevertheless, we think it's going to provide you and your students a lot of value and we'll be improving this capability over time. Okay, so now that the text is highlighted, we can tap to have it read aloud. Mae Jemison is a scientist. She is a researcher. She worked hard to become the first African-American woman to enter space. We can also tap several boxes at a time to queue up for a better storytelling experience. And if we make a mistake, it's simple to tap again to deselect. What else do you want to know about Mae Jemison? Directions. Answer the questions about the text. 1. What are some things Mae Jemison liked to do as a child? That's it. And when we're ready to enter our answers into the worksheet, simply press the text finder icon again and tap to add your answers. And of course, if you prefer, you can still use dictation to speak instead of type your answers. Okay, so that gives a pretty good idea. And yes, you can just, as he said, use dictation instead of type. So that makes it a complete tool, which makes me very happy. <laughs> so the next slide is Android phone. So on the left, I tried to type out the steps to getting this installed. It's it depends really on your phone and your operating system, but the first step is going to the Google Play Store and making sure that you have the latest version of the Google Accessibility Suite. So once you're there, uh, you install that Google Accessibility Suite, then just go back into the main settings and find your accessibility menu and tap through and find that. But um, I wanted to show you I feel like we're running short of time. So I'm not gonna do the double example here. I'll just explain really quickly. Um, I used that worksheet I got from Teachers Pay Teachers that had that kind of um, interesting looking font. I don't know if you've noticed it as I've been popping that worksheet on the screen. Um, I could go back and find it. Um, actually, I'm going to because I think this is an important point. Let me drag a couple things around here. 
And Jennifer, you, um, I just want to point out that you have about 28 minutes. So I don't know. Uh, you go to about okay. 15, just making sure you know our time frame. Okay. Well, I wanted to make sure I, yeah, yeah, that we had time for all the good things at the end, questions and a little case study, but thank you. That is very helpful. Um, so this is hard to see, but have you ever noticed that it seems like worksheets that were designed for younger audiences often use what I guess are kind of friendly kid looking fonts, but many times they're, uh, they're not friendly to text readers. They are kind of mushed together. And I apologize, you can't see this large. But um, basically, it the text reader sees letters as one or it sees them as something else. And you'll get some very interesting uh, pronunciations or just completely wrong pronunciations. So I took that text and I retyped it just to show the difference. Um, all right. Since you told me we have 28 minutes and this is a 26 second video, we'll show it. <laughs> so this is the original um, PDF I downloaded. It's just the camera on my phone. Um, this one made me find the edges. You'll see in the next one, for some reason, it found them. And then just um, save that. And that little, um, well, there's two things. There's my accessibility suite, which is the little person. Do you like popsicles? Did you know they were invented by a kid? Not only were they invented BYA kid, but it happened by accident L one night in 05. And <laughs> so you can hear it was kind of like instead of by it saw BY and then accident LY. And it's just kind of for a child trying to listen to that would be a little bit confusing. But um, if you format things in the first place with accessibility in mind, you're going to have a much better experience. So this time when I took the picture, it found the edges for me, which is super helpful. So I just click save and then open it back up in my photo gallery. And choose select to speak and it just finds the text. Do you like popsicles? Did you know they were invented by a kid? Not only were they invented by a kid, but it happened by accident. One night in 1905, an 11 year old boy from California. So a uh, much more accurate representation of the text when the font is out. And I realize I'm not in my slideshow mode. Sorry, y'all. OK, so. Um, OK, I was excited about that because it's just built into the camera on. Um, I'm an Android phone user, and that has been something that's been a little bit lacking in the Android Android world for a while. But now it is built in. However, there's also two awesome apps. Um, Lookout is it, there. Both of these are free and. OK, I was impressed how quickly this worked. So you guys ready for this? <laughs> Our same popsicle works. Move device right. Move the hold still. <laughs> Do you like popsicles? Did you know they were invented by a kid? Not only were they invented by a kid, but it happened by accident. Okay, so that's super cool, right? It's like almost instantaneous. And I can think of a few students right now where, you know, there's really a challenge with having a lot of paper materials presented to them and trying to figure out how to get those into an accessible format. And this really could be a quick solution to that. Uh, you know, I'd still like to keep advocating um, <laughs> with the adults around the kids that things should be in digital format. So we're not having to, you know, put it upon our students to make them accessible for themselves. But another great application, actually, this just happened earlier this year. There's a student that I've worked with on and off over many years, um, I think probably since sixth grade, and he's um, a transition student now. And his mom reached out to me because they've been working on uh, having him text a 
people with important information like his whereabouts or if he needed something, should he get lost or just for fun. He likes to send them texts. And so he's texting his family, his personal support worker, his teachers. Um, they're getting his texts and they reply, but he can't read their texts back. And so um, with actually turning on that accessibility feature of select to speak, I went, helped him install that on his phone. And now when he gets a text back, he literally just, he touches the little person, touches the select to speak, and it reads the text right back. And his mom was like, this is a game changer. Um, now he can hear what we're saying back to him. And so, yeah, Gail. Well, just what, how does he text other people? Um, speech to text. Thank you. I neglected to say that, which you probably knew and you're gently cueing me. I appreciate it. I was guessing, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure. Yes. Um, yes, he uses speech to text and he texts them, but he wasn't able to read their replies. So that's that's huge. And that's just built in accessibility now. So think about that, you know, with um, older people who need accessibility, both for, you know, if they do have, you know, cognitive challenges, so um, they're not readers, or they're limited with reading, or even talking much older when our vision starts to go <laughs> out, and we can literally just point our phone at something and have it read aloud. Um, the applications at a workplace for students that are kind of, you know, in supported employment and need help reading directions, um, just all the things around that. I was very excited by this. Envision AI basically does the exact same thing as Lookout. It's just another app. They're both free. Envision AI took about 10 seconds longer to process and it provided nice music while it did it though. So just an FYI. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about learning management systems. I I have this video from a that another teacher created. And one of the issues with learning management systems, which we found out in full force when we were in the whole learn at home year, right? And so many kids went to online school. Um, some of the online platforms that were being used, particularly for the elementary grades, had some built-in accessibility tools, but it seemed like by the time they were sixth grade and older, those tools, the, the built-in text-to-speech was no longer available, and um, students were not able to hear the text read. So in a learning management system, so this happens to be um, Florida Virtual Curriculum in the Canvas Learning Management System. And basically what happens is you've got a layer behind, you've got a layer in front of the the curriculum. So Canvas is kind of like looking at it through a window. So you can see it, but if you go to touch it, you're just touching this window that doesn't have any text on it. The text is hidden behind it. And so the text reader tools were not working. And um, I had tried several different kind of workarounds, found that actually, um, if they opened it up on Microsoft Edge, the built-in reader did a great job with it, um, but in Google Chrome, it wasn't working. And this teacher found a workaround, which I wanna share with you because I think it probably applies to many different and platforms. So here's a lesson. Now, I could click on this read, write, app you'll see it has this little down drop thing I'm going to click that but because the actual lesson slides are embedded into this website kind of like they're inside of a window you can't use this read write um, extension for this I can't highlight this text and hit go it doesn't recognize it as text as such. So there's one more step you have to do, but it's not hard. You click on the menu and you go to the lesson that you want, which is Heroes in Our Midst. You click that, that's the, you can see that right up here, Heroes in Our Midst. And then you choose the one that is right here, the number of the actual session you want and you right click 
Okay, so you right click. And to right click on a touchpad, you take two fingers at the same time and touch your touchpad on the right side. Let me do that without a mouse. So if I was just, if I let me, okay, <laughs> let's try again. Go to here, here is in our midst. All right, so I could take my mouse, I'm using touchpad now, and going to this one, and I'm gonna right click, and then you're gonna open link in a new tab. Okay, so you're gonna like this. It's gonna open it in a new tab, and it opened for me right here. And so I click on that. It is the exact same lesson, it's just not inside of Canvas right now, but it's the exact same lesson. And I, you'll notice that I'm gonna highlight what I want to re have read to me. I'm gonna click on that, Give it a second, and then this toolbar will show up. And you can move the toolbar toolbar around a little bit with on the web page, if it's kind of in your way. And while it the is highlighted, I can click, and it will read to me. And it even shows where the text is. I'm going to, and you you can pause at any point. Okay, and we will pause at that point. So. Um, she was using read and write, but at that point, you could also just use the uh, built-in select to speak on a Chromebook or any other text reader tool that your district may happen to have. So that was huge. And it didn't change how the lesson functioned at all or that the student, you know, that the teacher recognized that it had been completed by the student. It functioned just the same. So that was that was a great find. So I just wanted to share that challenge. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the possibility of, you know, when you're creating curriculum, considering using Google Forms as a medium to present that. So I'm back to my popsicles here. And um, I should have chosen something warmer because it's November than popsicles, <laughs> but <laughs> that's what we've got. Um, so uh, it took me... I mean, maybe two minutes to make this Google form because I already have the text in my Google Drive. I cut and paste it in. And in this case, um, just the way that a Google form works, because I didn't want the text to be a question, I just put that into, uh, so Popsicle Reading Passage was the title. And under the title, there's a section where you can put information. And so I just pasted it in the information section and um, then created questions. And now with the built-in Chrome accessibility tools of Select to Speak and Dictation that I showed you several slides ago how to enable, you can fully interact with this worksheet. And a quick note, I noticed. So teachers can go in and on the settings of their form and they can make it a quiz. So you can assign points and make it operate like the quiz. And now there's a new feature Google added where you can actually just toggle a button and it locks the student in your Google form in your quiz so they cannot go off onto another web page. Um, back when we first were using this, I had teachers asking about that and I was like, well, there's not really a way to lock it down, but they built that in now. So if a teacher puts a test on a Google form, they can lock and they're, they're stuck on that page, which is awesome. So let's see how the tools work with it. So, right, it's, um, well, actually, I am going to mute it because <laughs> um, it just wasn't picking up the text-to-speech, but it did read it. And then I used the dictation tool and just dictated my answer right in there. And that is an important point I want to bring up about that Chromebook dictation tool. So, Probably everyone knows about voice typing in a Google Doc, which is an awesome tool. Like it works so well, uh, you know, I'm speaking compared to the days of, um, and again, not, it's not that any product was bad. It's just, we've come a long way in technology, right? The days of Dragon naturally speaking and taking <laughs> hours to train your voice so that it would be halfway accurate <laughs> and just the, um, the, 
uh, I've lost my word right now, but voice typing, how it's just very intuitive, right? It goes back and it fixes grammatical errors. It finds homophone things. It fixes context. And it's just, um, you know, I find it to be pretty amazing for our students. But the one limitation, it only works in Google Docs. And the speaker selection, the speak the the speaker notes on a Google slide, right? Those are the only places that the awesome Google voice typing works. However, dictation on a Chromebook, which I feel the need to say, if you have a PC right now because you have a, a computer for work, you're not going to be able to find these tools on a PC. They're literally only on the Chromebook. That that video I showed you where you go in and enable those two tools. So, um. Yes. So anyway, the dictation tool is pretty amazing. You can dictate literally anywhere that you can type on a Chromebook. So think of the possibilities, job applications, emails, um, papers, whatever, wherever you need to type, you can talk. So that's pretty cool. Uh, okay. I'm not going to play this video after I created all of my lovely screenshots, <laughs> screen recordings for you all. I came across this and I'm like, huh, I guess it already existed in a sense. This uh, is a video from Georgia Project for Assistive Technology, which is an excellent resource for AT. If you're not aware of it, it is one of my go-tos. It has been from the day I learned about AT from my esteemed colleague Shannon we still have to bring her up I'm not ready to let her go <laughs> for those of you that don't know her she retired last year um and she's the reason I'm doing assistive technology but Georgia Project for AT has so many awesome resources and I didn't realize that they'd gotten into creating some video resources which um this is just an overview of many different platforms and how to access text to speech on them so it's a really good resource that I wanted you to have. All right, let's see what's next. Okay, so this was just a more succinct way of getting some information on the various tools that I've gone over, plus a couple of extras that I didn't want to leave out. Um, but for you to explore on your own, so there is a page for some Chrome-based tools. Okay, clearly there's a hundred different apps that we could have listed that are accessibility apps, but I just gave you the ones we talked about because <laughs> I'm, you know, this is the thing. I, it's pretty much impossible these days to keep up with every single piece of assistive technology or accessible technology out there for students. And I definitely want to invite you here in a second, if there is a tool that you've just learned about or something that you think is maybe new information or something that I'm completely unaware of, I would love um, to have you share that out because this resource is going to so many people and we don't want to miss any helpful resources. And then these are links to the Android tools that we talked about. And... That leaves some time for questions. I didn't know, Deb, if we wanted to do questions and then case study or vice versa. So I think we should probably go ahead and uh, you invite people to ask their questions in the chat box yes. or unmute. But I think we should probably go ahead with the case study uh, to make sure that we have time for it. So again, everyone fe feel free to type your any remaining questions in the chat. And let's talk about a student application, Jennifer. Okay, it's pretty quick, actually. I went back and forth on what I thought was going to be helpful, and I had originally just typed up kind of a scenario um, that I was aware of, but I ultimately decided that I liked this video. It's from Bookshare. We haven't talked about Bookshare at all, <laughs> but um, I'm hoping most of you know about Bookshare. If not, at least I'm dropping the name of it here. I assume that this was is going to get brought up in a later uh, session about where we get accessible materials, the accessible media producers. Bookshare is one of the big ones of those. So here we go. Oh, and before I click play, I thought to, you know, to try to make this a little bit of a conversation at the end, be thinking about basically, he does a really nice job of articulating how this has helped him. And just think about what benefits did he receive from 
from using digital books and, um, you know, kind of how they impacted his life, which is what I kind of wanted to focus on. So here we go. Bookshare, a Benetech Global Literacy Initiative. A student walks on the Texas A&M campus. I grew up in a small community of Thrall, Texas, not too far from here. And uh, my graduating class, I had 47 kids. It was definitely a worry on my mind, not knowing, you know, would I be good enough to get into a university. It was a struggle at first, especially with my uh, disability. My name is Colton Luton, and uh, I'm studying animal science in the College of Animal Science Sciences. Being dyslexic, you're not not intelligent. You're a smart individual. It's just you have problems in certain areas. You see the word, you just don't know how to say it. It's kind of like looking at a foreign language. Before using Bookshare, I could comprehend very well, but I'd have to reread pages over and over to really understand what the story was saying. With Bookshare, you can listen to the book as well as watch it across the screen or read along with it in the page. Colton reads and listens to a book on a tablet. It increased my comprehension level along with less than the time it took for me to have to read. It cut my time in half. Veterinary school, um, that's definitely where my heart and passion is and um, I should wake up every day and striving to do the best I can. In order to get into vet school, you have to have a, a very high GPA. That's where Bookshare can come in handy because you're reading these books and it's helping you comprehend and in the long run, you're doing better with your classes. I am powering right along and going strong. Starting next spring, I'm hoping to walk onto the football team as the kicker for A&M. Colton looks up at the football stadium. Balancing that in school will be difficult, but um, you know, it goes along with the dream. You gotta go big or go home. It's important to keep reading because there's always new and changing information. There's always gonna be another way to do something and you always have to adapt to the new way of life and what what different strategies you can use and and one of those new strategies is bookshare you're responsible for what you do you know what you want to get out of class is what you do outside of class and that that involves 99 percent of it is reading from using bookshare i can you know it increases my level of understanding knowing that i had dyslexia it was there was a lot of pressure not knowing that i would get accepted but don't be afraid to dream big. Um, I dreamed big and I ended up getting in and it's a dream come true. For more information, visit bookshare.org. So I also liked how that was a really good example of a narrated video, right? So the parts where there was action that was important for the viewer to understand it described. Uh, which was kind of a cool feature as well. So anyone feeling talkative? <laughs> I don't know how these case studies normally go, Deb. Um, I feel like, you know, if people would love to like to share, I would love to to have some input from you all. Of course, I have some answers to share, but um, just kind of he mentioned a lot of different things, like how that helped him I'm feeling like what would happen if I stopped presenting so we could see each other. Does that sound like a good idea? Go for it. Okay. I mean, I have a slide that shows uh, my answers, but <laughs> it's a bunch of names. So for um, the, the case study is usually reinforcing and applying what you have talked about in your content yeah. to an actual student. And so yep. that student it was a wonderful example of yes. uh, the things that are working for him. Um, taking that profile, what other tools or what tools might mm -hmm. you think uh, from today's session um, would Jennifer put in place for this student? I know it's four o'clock. <laughs> well, people are still able to uh, add their feedback, but uh, anything that you would like yeah. to share about, uh, please go ahead, Jennifer. Or yeah, did you have so, a question, Gail? Okay, I did not. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, 
I, what struck me was um, a few things beyond just the obvious, right? Like he stated that in the past he could comprehend things, but he had to read it and reread it and reread it. And with this, you know, with Bookshare and being able to listen to the text, he could just listen to it. And he said it cut his reading time in half, literally. And then talking about, you know, going out for football in the next season, if he had to spend twice as much time on his studies, he literally may not have time to go out for an extracurricular. And, you know, I don't know that I think I know for myself, I get really, you know, just focused on I'm here to give these kids tools and I know it makes their lives better. I'm not saying I don't think that, but I don't often stop to think like what, how else is this enriching the student's life, right? That they don't have to spend that exorbitant amount of time just getting the same content that their peers are. And, you know, that really stuck out to me. And he also mentioned how it increased his comprehension, which is a known fact for, you know, listening to things auditorily along with that text component that most of the time it's going to increase the comprehension level for uh, people using that tool. And then yeah, Jennifer, I wanted to point out too that yeah. I've had a student who learned these same lessons about how valuable uh, hearing material was for him. And he and his mom uh, both uh, shared how it cut down the tension at the house uh, mm -hmm. because he was able to do these things uh, independently. And mom didn't have to keep saying, do your homework, do your homework, do your homework, because he had tools uh, for right. independence that. Uh, it, so it just changed the whole family dynamic. I was going to say, when I used to do IEPs um, and talk about, you know, like as the OT going in and doing testing and saying, here are some, here are the areas that are deficit on my tests. Um, I, I spent a lot of time explaining how much longer learning took when you had to work around things and that that meant that those students were putting in twice as much effort and they really needed their their support systems to acknowledge that and, and call out to them about it because our kids, you know, by the time they get tested, they've already felt stupid. And, and in their head, they, they, we have to be as the support person. You know, I felt that was really a critical role for me as the OT to, to let those people that are surrounding the student, let them know that they're working so hard and that they need to hear that because they don't actually have it show up in class they still show up with things half done or you know but no one acknowledges all the work they put in to what they did and it was you know you could tell when some families were like oh, i never thought of that some were like oh whatever but you know but it was like i felt like that helped the, the student as well that their support system understand how much effort they're putting into it Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, the whole support system, family, teachers, all of that, and um, just uh, how that can, yes, build their independence level, um, and just, uh, you know, enrich their education so much and that they're not depending upon that adult sitting next to them to read it, um, or taking, you know, going home and spending three times as long as everyone else on the homework assignment. So, and the, yeah, the you know, self-esteem, really... the beating that the self-esteem takes along the way you touched on, Kathy, that here I feel like mm -hmm. what is wrong with me? And over time, you know, it just really kind mm -hmm. of beats you into submission if you don't find tools. Gail, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, I just it, something he said about the football made me wonder about what kind of reading tasks are there on a football team? And, you know, what kind of accessibility features would he need in order to be a kicker on the team? Because I assume there are a lot of playbooks and stuff like that. So I, I yeah. think we're always, um, as people who are providing AIM and thinking about what, what vehicles for AIM, we're always um, looking at new challenges and hopefully teaching kids like him to take that information that he's using in classrooms and move it on to the under the football field. I just, I got tickled with the idea of doing that. Absolutely. Well, something also is I am, I have to read out loud to myself. Um, I'm a student who 
was not identified with anything, but always knew that I had ADHD. My mom forced me, and I mean that in a positive way, to learn my learning style. Um, and because of that, I have gone to observe some of my students who have more are more significantly impacted with their disabilities in their general education classrooms with teachers that I feel like never struggled as students. And so they don't understand a lot of these little things that can easily, A, help a lot of the kids in the class, not just the kids that may be labeled as somebody who needs help. Um, but I also just tested a student who read independently by himself at a ninth grade level as a seventh grader comprehended completely 100%. But when I read to him, it was a third grade level. Mm. So just those kinds of things that, you know, unless you dig and mm. maybe also understand what that can look like and how it could be, um, makes things a little bit different too. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Very it's, much. Been a, it's been a wonderful session, Jennifer. Um, thank you for joining us today. I, I loved the the clear sequence of, of tools that you gave us to get started on, on thinking about some of the options for AIM. And we know there's a hundred more, 